Um, just a quick uh, couple of things. Um, this is our first attempt at a public forum um, via Zoom, so please uh, bear with us and, and give us some uh, patience. We're at the beginning of this discussion, so we want everyone's ideas on the table. Whatever your ideas are, please feel free to share. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, uh, saying them online, uh, feel free to either use the message bar um, with Zoom or send um, an email uh, after the meeting or give our office a call. Um, I am going to turn it over to uh, Liz Courtney, who is going to help us with um, introductions and um, an, an icebreaker to get to know each other. Thank you, Seth. Hi, everybody. Um, really, thank you so much for taking the time out in your afternoon to join this conversation. We're excited to see all you people joining us. Um, those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Liz Courtney, and I'm the secretary from the Gaihan Valley Hall Committee. And if you're wondering what the Gaihan Valley Hall is, that is the new committee that's formed to take stewardship of the old Grange Hall building that is in the heart of North Hyde Park Village. So we've been working over the past about year and a half to do some renovations of the building and starting to open it back up and reimagine it as a community center and as a venue where everybody in Hyde Park and Eden and beyond can use it as a community space for all kinds of different events. Um, obviously, we're not doing a lot of events there right now at this moment because of um, circumstances with the pandemic, but we're really excited to begin opening it up again before too long. Um, so I want to give everyone on this call just a really quick chance to say hello. I know there's a lot of people here, so we're going to make this really fast. Um, I will call you all out by name, at least based on what I see on the screen, because I know it's hard to like go around the circle when everyone's circle kind of looks different on the Zoom screen. Um, but if everyone can just say your name, say who you represent. So if you're here, for example, on behalf of a committee or on behalf of a business, maybe you can mention that. Um, that's just helpful context for us. And then tell us in either one word or just a few words, a phrase, what it is that brought you here today, what you're maybe most excited about or interested um, in talking about when it comes to thinking about the future of the high park. And also, if anyone is not on mute, if you could put yourself on mute when you're not talking, that's helpful. Um, so for example, my phrase, my one thing that comes to mind when I think about the future of this neighborhood, um, it's having a walkable neighborhood. I'm gonna pass it now to, I see Al Spitzer. Um, yeah, my, uh, yeah, pretty close to mine because I'm, I'm thinking sidewalk. Um, I think we need a sidewalk on the side where the hall is uh, from the post office down to, to uh, the junction of 100 C at the very least. And Al, who are you here on behalf of? I know the answer, but not everyone else might. Oh, I well, run that by me. I didn't. Who are, who are you representing today on this call? Is there maybe a committee that you are a part of? Yes, I'm the chair of the of the uh, Lihon Valley Hall Committee. Right, thanks. Okay, I see um, someone who says whose name is C D. Do you want to say hello? Not sure who that one is. All right, we'll we'll skip you and come back to you. Um, who is V A R ninety three? Uh, that would be me. I'm Chris Manturic. Um, yeah, I'd like to see um, a park. There's a plot that's been sitting vacant for uh, decades, um, probably longer, with a house on it that's just dilapidated. It's got like it's going uh, towards. Uh, Johnson on the right hand side. It's a small little sh like a shack of a house um, and that property has been sitting like that uh, in disuse for uh, yeah, like I said decades and that goes all the way down to the river. That would be a nice uh, like location to set up a little park I would think. Thank you Chris. Um, Alec Jones. Hi Alec Jones here. Um, I'm with the Moyle County Planning Commission. Um, and I'm just interested in the whole process, I guess. 
Thanks, Alec. Okay, how about farm wife's iPad? Who's that? Hi, I'm Bonnie Blaisdell. My husband and I live right here in North Hyde Park. We're actually Liz's neighbor. Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> Hi, um, looking to see what can be done with the town so it comes back into North Hyde Park to be known as and not just part of Hyde Park that nobody knows about. <laughs> so, great. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks. Okay, how about Michael? I suppose that's me. I'm Michael Rooney and um, we live on Centerville Road. So not really in North Hyde Park. We, we have a farm here and I'm very interested in the Grange as a Grange, not the new kind of Grange, the old kind of Grange. As a small farmer, we have constant problems uh, getting uh, enough muscle to deal with uh, various uh, uh, organizations that might buy from us. The other thing is I'm a member of the Fiber Committee for Hyde Park, and our goal is to bring fiber to every address in Hyde Park. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Amy Olson. Hi, I, um, I'm the library director at the Landfair Memorial Library in Hyde Park Village. I grew up in Hyde Park, and um, those of you who have been in community meetings with me before may have heard me say this, but I often say that it's easy to forget that there's more to Hyde Park than the village when you're in the village. It's a sweet little place. But um, I didn't grow up in the village of Hyde Park and I really am interested in how Hyde Park can, like Bonnie was saying, we're more than just one little area, one little pocket of town. So how we can serve all people in Hyde Park and have people understand that there's more to Hyde Park than just the village. So, um, and the library serves everybody too. So on a personal note, growing up in Hyde Park, I always felt a disconnect from things that were happening, but on a professional note, I wanna make sure that the library is serving everybody, including making connections in North Hyde. Okay, thank you, Amy. Okay, Neil Johnston. Neil, are you there? Okay, we're gonna skip Neil. Mary Waltz, wanna say hi? Mary? Yeah, I'm here, sorry. Yes. I've, I got lost on my mute, unmute button, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I think somebody said already, I'm just interested in the whole thing. Um, I. I I think the North Village is beautiful. I, I love the hall. I love the idea of the park, the river. I'd love to see traffic slowed down and to have it be a place that people go to and don't just pass through. So that's my, that's my interest. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, Zeph Courtney, my better half. What brings you here? Um, hi. Well, I would like to uh, just speak up for wanting, which is a beautiful building, um, to make sure it doesn't fall into disrepair. I know people are already on that, and just to make sure that there's there's follow through on that and that keeps going, because uh, it's a beautiful building, and I think it could be a center for activity, for community activity. Um, so many different things I could talk about that I think could be happening over at the hall, um, but all that. Being said, first and foremost, I agree that a sidewalk is probably what um, the first order of business should be. And that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kate Lolly, do you want to say hi? We're just, we're just, I think maybe you joined later, but we're just saying um, hello. Who are you here on behalf of? Um, if that is part of your answer. And then is there just one word or phrase of, of something that you're most interested in when it comes to thinking about the future of North Hyde Park. Yes, hi. Um, I um, will be helping you guys out with this uh, with this grant proposal project. Um, 
I am um, a, a landscape architect and um, urbanist. And um, um, anyway, I, I think um, I, I would like to restore um, some of the, the uh, potential that has been lost, I think, um, in the village. I think there's a, it's a tremendous place, but um, you know, the car orientation um, has taken its toll over the decades. And I think there are some opportunities to kind of reclaim the space. Um, we have to work within the constraints of what um, is allowed, uh, given that it's a, classified as a state highway. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that can be done to um, enhance the sense of space, sense of place, and um, and and celebrate some of the attributes that others have uh, um, alluded to already. Um, and so I'm I'm hoping to um, looking forward to working with you guys and helping you develop some strategies for doing that. Great, thank you. Is there anybody else who I may have skipped that wanted to say hello? Okay, Seth, I'll pass it back to you. Great. So um, the next thing we're gonna do is we want to um, hear from you on, uh, you know, bigger, uh, bigger uh, ideas and build on some of what we talked about. So we're gonna start um, by talking, you know, about the guy on hall and then it's, uh, um, grounds and the building, um, then move on to talking about the village as a whole. Um, and that could be the river access, sidewalks, um, different functions you might want to see. And then in our last bit of the meeting, we'll spend some time talking about tying the village into the rest of the community. Um, so I've put up some prompts if folks have trouble uh, knowing where to start because it's a big, uh, big thing. Um, we don't necessarily need to answer all of these questions. They're just to get you thinking. Um, so I'll turn it over first to um, you all for your thoughts uh, specifically about the uh, Guyon Valley Hall, um, the former Grange, and you know what, what you might like to see on the space, how you might like to see it used, how you might like to see it integrated into the community as a whole. And I know folks have thoughts and people might just not want to be the first one to uh, speak. So um, for those of you who, I guess for those of you who have been working on um, the building, maybe we'll start there. Um, you know, what are some of the ideas for um, programming or building needs or other things you've been talking about so far? I mean, I, I can start by sharing just a little bit of background. Um, so our committee has been thinking about programming and kind of using this downtime to do a bit of planning. And we did a survey um, that we started on town meeting day and, and of the people that have responded, we have a lot of folks, at, and this definitely reflects, I think, a lot what our committee feels, that especially would love to see the space as a place for live music performance. Um, there's a, people that seem to have a lot of fond memories of times where they would go there for dances when there was live bands playing. And I think there's a lot of wonderful talent in this area that would enjoy having another venue where they could perform and bring people together. So there's lots of different ways you can use the space, but that's the one that, that seems to come up most frequently, especially because the building has this beautiful stage and it's just a really ideal space for, for live music performance. Um, we've also talked about and had a lot of people echo an interest in using it as a space for um, like workshops and arts and crafts related um, activities and bringing people together, whether that's for like farmer's market type events or craft fairs or just learning from each other. So people hosting workshops, you might learn a new skill or having someone come in and give a talk. Um, I know Amy, we've talked about collaborating with the library on, on having events where people come in and, and give talks, whether that's on history or on current events or anything really. Um, so I think there's a lot of different types of programming and we really like to see programming that is diverse and, and serves 
um, the diversity of, of our neighborhood because we have young people with kids and we have older people who are retired and we have farmers and we have artists and I think the space could really serve all of those folks. Um, I could say a little thing. Um, just talk to Liz a little bit about some of the things that, um, you know, the idea that we have for using the space. And um, I'd quite like it to have an informality and an and availability to people that it's sort of open. Um, I don't know how you do that quite because we're not there yet, but it'd be nice for it to have sort of drop inness and times when people could just gather because they know the building is open and that they know somebody will be there and there's a cup of coffee and, you know, something like that. And Wi Fi is available and maybe even some books on the wall and just be there and see people. Of course, you see them on the sidewalk as well, but somehow it's nice to just have a place away from traffic, even if we get traffic slowed, you know, um, it's still, there's traffic. That's my thought. So uh, this I, I, I agree that um, uh, uh, everything that was just said, that it being a place that as much as possible was just sort of open and that there was certain kinds of programming that was regular that people could rely on, hopefully. Um, maybe like a, a day for yoga, a day for meditation and arts and crafts time, certain periods, but that the rest of the time during business hours, if it could be exactly what someone just said, someplace with a couple of tables and Wi-Fi would be tremendous. Hi, so this is Amy Olson. And when, when you start talking that, I get a little um, like, we already have that in Hyde Park, it's the library, but um, <laughs> the drop-in and Wi-Fi and um, cup of coffee and all that, not right now, obviously, but, um, but I do see how that can expand into North Hyde Park for sure. And people who don't come all the way into the village of Hyde Park. Um, but I, I also really resonates with me. People who want to use the library space want to use it for things like dance classes, yoga. Um, we can't offer that. So what we can offer is the books and the coffee and the Wi-Fi, but what we can offer is this great space for people to be able to do these things. Liz, we did talk about um, other communities in Hyde Park, Bethel and Irisburg do um, like a month out of the year where it's the Irisburg University and they have classes that are just free to anybody who wants to come and and taught by local people, so if there's a local skill to share. But something else that there is a need for that I haven't heard mentioned yet is a place to gather and eat together. The library has worked with the church in the second congregational church in, in Hyde Park Village to do stone soup. And we've done that a couple years in a row to the point where it's the place is packed and we don't have enough room for people in that in that church hall that they have. So the Guyon Hall would be perfect for those types of events and has a very long history of, of having big meals and big community meals too. So I think that would be really nice to bring people together to eat together. And I, uh, I certainly didn't mean to step on the library's toes. No, 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 no. I, no, I know, it's I totally fine. Like my ego is not that big that I can't, it's just no, it's my go-to response. It's like, no, we have that, but we don't, but it, but we, we aren't the only place that can have that thing. And I totally get that there's a need for it outside of, I, I just gave the lecture too about there's more to Hyde Park than just the village. So I'm, I'm really good with whatever works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I started that. So I apologize, Amy, that um, I think- There's no need to apologize. Places, no. Never too many places to drop into. But also I think the other thing I would really like to see is um, really kind of, uh, informal use of the stage. I mean, music for sure, but also um, other kinds of performance and little mini theater. And yes, there is the opera house, but um, I think there are other ways that we could do things that would um, just, is the stage is darling and small and, and could be fun to use in different ways. Well, I agree with that as well. And I've, uh, I've told Liz, you know, I'm, I have a rehearsal studio practically across the street from the hall and I'm willing to volunteer um, my time to try to organize musicians that could be available for 
different things that people might want to do. Um, and that as far as um, trying to think differently about entertainment and about music, one memory that people seem to have about the hall is dances. And there's a big difference between music for dancing and what goes on at a lot of music venues or, um, nowadays, which is more about seeing bands and it's more about the band and less about the experience of, you know, actually going and dancing. I'd like to see, um, try to do more of that with music at the hall. Zeph, that is something that people, uh, that in my experience, what people have been asking for in the past, that is something that people have been craving as well. So I, I second that. And it's, you know, and it's something that could be, I mean, I'm talking about dancing for kids, for people of all generations, different programming, different nights, you know, and I, like I said, I'd be up for trying to participate as a musician because that is kind of an ambitious goal to have, um, you know, a venue that could accomplish that. But that's, that would be a, you know, that, that's my vision for it. One thing that's a big challenge when we think about programming at the hall and especially these these bigger scale events like having a big dance. Um, I think most of us know a big challenge right now is parking and that's going to be something that we're working to find better solves for. So I'm interested in this municipal planning project um, starting to explore what some different options and alternatives are for parking, if not adjacent to the hall, then nearby the hall with accessibility via, you know, crosswalks and sidewalks so that we can feel more comfortable um, hosting some large scale events, knowing that people will have a safe way to access it. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. And, and um, even if it's an interim stage where we can use certain you know, the parking that's near the post office or other places that have been identified. If we could get some, I know there is some, we have some sign that says event parking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but something- You're still walking along the shoulder, which is not ideal. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But if we're gonna try and use the space yeah, I don't know what we do, but there, there, there must be a stage one solution that, that creates some kind of infrastructure. I don't know what that would be. I guess VTrans would stop you from putting up. If, if you need to get safely from that space to the hall, it, if there's a way we can sign it and make it semi-permanent or something for the interim, so that every time you do something, you mm -hmm. don't to explain to people where they can park and how to get there. And I don't know. I don't well, know what again, the solution think, is, but. I, I think that's why the sidewalk, I mean, everything that I would like to do there, I feel is contingent on there being a sidewalk that could at least lead from the parking beside the post office to the hall. Because otherwise it's just, you, I just feel like that's not safe to invite large groups of people to something like that. So I, I think kind of, I mean, my opinion is that everything is contingent on that and everything else is kind of a slightly longer term goal. Mm -hmm. So that's a good uh, starting to transition to the bigger picture village. Um, I want to make sure that before we make that transition, um, we talk about any outstanding ideas. So if anyone who hasn't had a chance to talk about what you'd like to see at the Grange wants to put things on the, the table um, now, uh, please feel free to, um, to, to, to do so. Uh, hello, my name is Chris. I had, I had first, I would ask, what, what's the uh, population we're, we're working with here and uh, like the demographics, are we appealing to like other neighboring villages like Eden or other places where they're going to drive by and see this cool thing is happening and they're going to want to visit it too. Is it like, I, I, I would like to see uh, like a, a universal thing happening there where you have a music, you have like a farmer's market, you have people where they can donate uh, hardware and um, tool where somebody else can go and get the tool, borrow the tools. Like, a, cause like I have like six uh, skill saws. I'm sure like somebody might want mm -hmm. to use a skill saw. You know what I mean? There's, we have abundance of this kind of stuff where it could be more sh shared so it becomes more of a community center um designed to like connect people together and yeah like workspace workshop space maybe um like you said having like uh, some kind of uh 
people talk and giving lectures there, but having the ability to actually work there, maybe somebody doesn't have a table saw in his house. And the base, that's a huge building. There's a, there's a lot of uh, square footage in that building. Um, but I agree with the, there should be a sidewalk going to the large parking lot that's next to the post office where everybody could centrally park and then walk from there to the Grange in a, in a safe manner. Um, that would make sense to me. But yeah, I guess that's my two senses. Um, who, what's the population and what's the demographics? And also like you could, I could see ping pong pool as a winter activity because we're all cooped up inside and maybe you don't want to go to the bar. You just want to go play pool or ping pong with some friends. You know, that would be like a nice activity to have. And it was, you know, those things are cheap. We could, uh, I, I would, you know, invest in that kind of thing. Yes, I love the ping pong idea. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, somebody write down ping pong. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> Yeah, Chris, I really love all those suggestions. And we've talked about some of those things, especially at one point we talked about the idea of the, the building being a home for a lending library. Um, you know, not just, not necessarily of books, but of tools, um, especially thinking about the history of the building as, as the Grange, um, you know, people that have farming and homesteading skills um, and being able to come together to do skill sharing and also sharing of the actual tools to do the jobs. I love that idea. But yeah, the demographics question, um, we've definitely talked about the building being a place for everybody. Um, so we really wanna invite other people in the community to help us with programming. So as the Guyon Valley Hall Committee, we will um, certainly have a certain number of events every year where we're really focused on um, sort of just raising awareness for, for the space and also fundraising for the ongoing um, development of the space but we would love to fill the calendar with events that are hosted by a diversity of people in the community, whether that's yogis or carpenters or farmers or people that do music or people that do programs with kids. Um, would really like to see a, a wide variety. And certainly beyond the immediate neighborhood too. So like people from Eden who are driving by, we'd love, you know, the building's tucked back a little bit from the road. So we'll have to think about placemaking in the whole community. How can we make people more aware, like welcome to North Hyde Park Village. Here is something that's happening here. Um, you know, we'll, we'll use all the, the channels that are available to us to spread the word about what's going on. But I think there's also physical things that we can do in the space in that corridor of North Hyde Park Village to let people know that they've arrived someplace and they're not just whizzing by on the highway. And I, I should add folks um, that Eden is a co-applicant on the um, municipal planning grant that is, is funding this work. Um, so there definitely is interest uh, in sort of broad community. Um, before we kind of move to the village core discussion, are there any other thoughts about the hall? And I, I, hate to do this to put anyone on the spot, but I know when we were doing the one word, there were some thoughts about the um, traditional function of a, of a Grange. Um, does anyone want to expand on what that might look like uh, today? Uh, this is Michael Rooney. Well, I, um, I think I was the one that said that, so what the hell? Uh, um, a, one of the problems that uh, many small farmers have is having enough muscle to deal with their prospective customers, uh, particularly when you get into selling to groceries, uh, you know, whether it's a, a chain of co-ops or the chain of supermarkets, they want a certain level of supply uh, a regular supply, shall we say, every month or every week or whatever. And it's often hard for small farmers to be able to supply any, uh, any mesh of crops across every week or every month because they only can grow so much. Uh, the day of the 100 acre farm that's growing, you know, only carrots or something like that is, is pretty much gone. People at that scale grow something else that's more profitable. But uh, uh, if we got together 
uh, I know we don't grow any beef cattle anymore because we can't put enough beef cattle on our land to give a prospective customer one cow a month, for example. Uh, that, that kind of thing is, is what a grange used to do. They used to be the sort of in between the farmer and the, call it wholesale customer, but at the, the end customer, not a, not a retail customer, just a, a buyer, you know, somebody for a, a store, restaurant, or um, something like that. Does that make any sense? <laughs> It definitely makes sense. Yeah. I, I would love to see some sort of um, like a, a way for all of our, our area farmers, small scale farmers who have these similar challenges that you're talking about, um, forming some sort of, you know, not just a social group, but an actual like um, support group where you guys can come together and maybe have regular meetings at the hall where you swap ideas and team up on projects that can help um, scale your impact by working together. Could be, or it could be also somebody at the hall was sort of the, the go-to person and a, a farmer could say, hey, uh, you know, Joe Ellen, I have uh, 14, uh, tons of this and I'd like to find a customer for it and everybody else that's got the same product would then be talking to that same person so they're they're sort of a uh, a funnel you know the end of the funnel and uh, they're going to then funnel it out the other way and maybe there's a way for us to at least be um, like a central point of connection to help get all the local farms talking to each other so that you guys can coordinate better. Yeah. At yeah, least as quite... a starting point. And um, the uh, Vermont Department of Agriculture might even pay for someone to be in that role in, in the hall. I don't know that they would, but uh, mm -hmm. that, that's one of the things that they want to do is I know the Department of Agriculture wants to encourage uh, small farms to keep existing and it's a struggle as we all know. Yeah, I, I just add on the Vermont Department of Agriculture that the um, Working Lands Enterprise Grant includes a service provider um, category that can fund something um, like that and something for you all to think about geographically um, is that Hyde Park is located in a really good place in, in Lamoille County as a whole, um, but Hyde Park Eden specifically because you are more or less equidistant between um, Stowe, which is the largest concentration of farm to plate restaurants in Vermont, um, Jay Peak, which you know is having some struggles, but is, is also another major, um, you know, uh, destination as well as um, the, the Burlington area. Um, so, you know, there's some real opportunity there. Um, this aggregation issue does seem to be a major uh, issue for small farmers. So it's definitely something to be uh, thinking about. Are other thoughts about um, the hall? Um, yep. You're, you're on mute. Never get that right. Uh, the work, the grant you just mentioned, the Working Lands Enterprise Grant, is that in existence or that potential? That, um, the program is in existence. I'm not aware of any service provider grants being sought in our region. I um, see, okay. But it's a, a program that, that is available that, that's worth looking into. Okay, thanks. Um, before we move on to um, sort of the village uh, wide issues, um, are there any thoughts from anyone who hasn't shared anything about the hall? Any, oh, 
I think what we're going to end up having to do in order to get the village um, resident participation there is, um, is have a way for them to, uh, to get into the hall, like a, if you're going to have a library or book swap or whatever, or if you're going to have a, a ping pong table, they want to go in and play. Uh, we do have the lockbox on the outside and the people that would want to go in there for whatever reason uh, would have to have the combination to that so they could get a key and go in. Um, you know, that's going to be a kind of an iffy situation at times maybe, but, but I think that uh, that's probably what we're going to have to do to get, uh, you know, they can't just, there's not going to be anybody there full time unless we could find a, a retired person or somebody who'd like to go down there and be a, a greeter or uh, uh, like a, an overseer or something. They wouldn't get paid probably, but maybe they'd have a lot of fun. I don't know. But that, that side of it is probably got to have something happen there. You can't just go and sit on the steps and play cards, you know. Yeah, so those kind of semantics are like uh, those are the kind of details that I get weighed down with. But certainly, you know, I would be willing to also we could work out some sort of way that people could pick up a key and even check it out at the library, and that way they have some accountability for it too for returning it, and we know who has it and how many keys are out there, something like that. So. I, I think the lockbox idea is fantastic, but there's also got to be some level of mm, safety with that as well, because that building is just so special that <laughs> you don't want it getting, you know, there has, I feel like accountability behind it is good, but those are the kind of details that I totally get bogged down with. think that you're going to find that if you could get the word out into Eden a little better, Eden is kind of a bedroom town. Uh, it's a, there's a lot, the age demographic is a lot more than it is in Hyde Park. Um, those, those young people, there's a lot of teenagers and young and, and elementary school kids that that they probably don't have anything to do because Eden is not exactly a boom town. Um, but uh, somehow we got to get the word out to them and they would probably be one of our more heavily used groups sometime in the future. Yeah, Al, I live, this is Amy Olson again. I live in Lowell, so I hear you there. That's, that's definitely true. Great. So um, lots of good thoughts about the hall. Uh, let's uh, shift to um, the village uh, wide issues. So that can be anything from, you know, the sidewalk pedestrian safety, um, the park idea, river access. Um, and really the idea here is, you know, what, what's, what's your vision uh, for the village um, in the future? A lot of you have talked about just an observation um, from the outside perspective. The consistent thing I hear, you know, we hear um, is this uh, traffic safety walking issue. Um, let's maybe zoom in for a little bit specifically on those uh, type of type of challenges and it can be both you know what are the challenges as well or what are some ideas you might have for dealing with them I've spent some time at the hall just sitting and wait, waiting and looking around and I have spent some time uh, down by the uh, by where the old state garage used to be and you you in that in the whole village uh, there's no question that uh, the 35 mile an hour speed limit is not 
sufficient to slow them down. I don't know what is, but we need to have maybe some of those flashing speed limit signs and drop that speed limit down to 30 or, or at least, if not lower. Uh, the traffic, it looked to me like it was averaging closer to 45, 50 than it was 35. And when you're standing in the hall there, the noise is absolutely deafening. You can't hear you. We, we, I've been out with Mary and I've been out with other people standing in the front of the hall trying to talk and you can't, it's, it's that bad. It's, it's like, they're just going way too fast. And, and I, the volume of traffic is very high. Um, probably not a lot we can do about that, but if we could get them to calm down a little bit, it would help. Yeah, that's a big concern for us too, as we, we live right in the village, right on Route 100, and we have a small child and we won't let her play in the front yard and we won't let her play in the driveway because we, we're terrified of her tumbling into traffic. So um, yeah, people definitely speed through the neighborhood and it's a high traffic place. So anything that could help calm traffic and make it a little safer would make us feel more comfortable living here on such a busy yeah. road. And I drive through, I live in Lowell, work in Hyde Park, so I drive through North Hyde Park every, used to be every day, but let's assume every day. Um, but I have some people, I know Liz and Seth and their little one and, and other friends and family members who live right on Route 100 in North Hyde Park. So I think that shifting our language, Liz, you keep calling it the neighborhood. And I think that that is something people, like you were saying, people just drive through North Hyde Park. They don't see it as a neighborhood where people live and have children who play and want to ride their bikes or whatever it is. So, um, so I think that having sidewalks so that people are w walking and people can, drivers can see actual people <laughs> wanting to be a part of their neighborhood and community will help slow that traffic down. But I am a big fan of the, um, the traffic, the digital ones that tell you how fast you're going and remind you of the speed limit. I don't know if they work, but I like them. I know there are, um, I mean, remind me, Liz, if I'm just, uh, if I just dreamed this, but I feel like there are other towns around here that are on state highways that have done things like um, put up a median um, or uh, like, I forget who alluded to it, but I, there's other things like, uh, signage like a, like a historical sign or entering historic Hyde Park um, something with some writing on it um, a sidewalk a median uh, the flashing digital sign I think um, it being a state highway and us being kind of limited should probably try to do everything at our disposal how, how feasible is a median yeah we've talked about the example of Danville they did some similar street calming where they, they have signs that tell you you're entering the village. They have um, sort of a low medium, medium, medium <laughs> that you can drive over if you're a truck or if you're a plow, it's not going to get in the way, but it, it you know, it gives them and like um, curbs that sort of bump out for crosswalks. So there's just these subtle signals that you're entering a place where there are going to be pedestrians. And that's all stuff that could be explored and has been explored. Um, there was a study that the town did in, I forget now, 2016, um, that looked at a bunch of different designs for street calming measures that could be applied in North Hyde Park. So part of this project is going to revisit those ideas and, and maybe build on those ideas. What Danville's done, part of what they've done is a speed drop on both ends of the village. Uh, we don't have that up here. You're going 50, which means you're going 60, 70, and all of a sudden it says 35, and it's that is that already is too close to the village uh, because it's right across the sign is right across the road from the fire department, and we've had complaints from the fire trucks uh, almost getting hit because people were going 60, 70 miles an hour until they get down to the fire department and they can't even get a fire truck onto the road sometimes. Have to wait for these speeding cars to get out of the way so they can pull out. They won't even slow down for red lights. Uh, so we need a speed drop and, and Danville is from 50, 40, and 30. And then 
I think it goes to 25 in the main right there where you go over the top of the hill in front of the school. And what they've done there is put them, like you say, mediums in there. They're like raised pavers. They're not something that you couldn't drive on if you had to, but what it does is when they move their their sidewalk is it acts as a it's a six or eight inch curb also. And so what it forces traffic to do is they feel like they're driving in a tunnel. And they're absolutely right, actually. They're, they're, the road is not much wider than a truck. So if, especially a truck driver, and they're the ones that make the most noise, but they feel like they gotta be really pay attention and slow down or they're gonna either hit the curb or they're gonna hit the median. And they aren't far from right because it's very narrow. And so that's what they've done there and it works. Of course, of course, they also got a tree colored light in the middle of Danville, which so they have to stop eventually. And then of course, when they start off, it takes them a while to get back up to high speed. Um, so, you know, I don't imagine we could do that there, but uh, probably need a crosswalk or two um, right by Liz's house would be a good spot. I noticed one day this last week, I was watching things and I heard, I saw several people that were walking on uh, the hall side of the road and they walked up a little where they were looking behind them, keep turning and looking behind them to see if they're going to get run over. And when they got up by just past Liz's house, they, they crossed the road. So apparently several people want to be able to go from one side to the other. Uh, and if you do have a sidewalk here, your crosswalks have got to go with it. because They got to be able to go from one side to the other. Um, you know, but in the long, I think we got to do all of that stuff in order to get things calmed down in there. It's like, a, you know, most people don't even acknowledge that it's 35. They, they're at least 45, 50 miles an hour. Uh, and they're talking on their cell phone and, you know, it's like trying to walk on Thunder Road, you know, it's not going to work very good. So that's a main that's probably the number one problem that we kind of have in the village for both to attract uh, new residents and and to, uh, attract people to come into the village for whatever reason although there aren't a lot of reasons to come there and we have to build one um, there used to be two stores there now there's none but we also have to find a way to get them down and be able like, to walk down to uh, the uh, River Valley Market. Um, and that's not going to be easy because when they, they built that new bridge, they didn't put a sidewalk on it. I was going to say, I agree that the traffic is one of the big concerns. Um, we have a lot of problems. Um, we live right on the 100 right next to Liz. Um, we've put buckets out front to try to slow people from coming into our driveway at a high rate of speed to do a turnaround or something. Um, we've almost been hit walking out of our garage door in the basement um, because of it. And we've tried the signs. Um, I think that's going to be the biggest concern is uh, slowing people down in the town and like you said, do the decrease speed limit, put signs up saying you are entering, you know, North Hyde Park Village and something to that effect. So this is Amy Olson again. It seems, to, I don't know a lot about how the state likes to, you know, how they allocate the permission to do all those things, but it does seem to me that North Hyde Park has a very good case, Al, like you were saying, on either end. So on the fire station end, there is a fire station. So that seems like a safety, a health and public safety kind of reason to slow down or to have signs. Or And then on the other side, there is the turnoff on 100C, which can get a little hairy depending on which way you're going. So it does seem to me that aside from the fact that we want people to slow down for human safety, there, there are some good reasons on either end of, of the village, the North Village, to be able to do that. So I think there's a good case for that in, in my uneducated opinion.
Well, that the junction of 100C is another big problem that we have, not really with the hall, but in the driving through North High Park in general. Um, a couple of years ago, I drove through there four times every day, six times every day. And what happens is when you're going south, doesn't matter what speed you're going, when the cars are pulled up to the stop sign on 100C, you're not supposed to have to turn the turn signal on to go to Hyde Park because you're on the main thoroughfare. However, it doesn't make any difference. You should turn it on because I, I would say that every one out of three trips that I went through there, when I approached that intersection, if there was a vehicle sitting there, they pulled out in front of me and almost hit them. It's very, very, very often. Uh, they, they stop at the sign, then they see you coming. They don't, they, just because you don't have a right turn signal on to go to Johnson, they think you're going, they, they think that's where you're going anyway. So they pull right out in front of you. And, uh, you know, that's a very dangerous spot. I don't know what they're going to do about that, but, uh, you know, it, it is a, something to think about. Yeah, especially if we're thinking about connectivity to the River Valley store and adding, you know, more pedestrian traffic going along the road there. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Seth? Yes, you can. I'm not sure um, where we're going next, but I, I was wondering if in addition to that parcel of land that somebody else, I think maybe it was Chris mentioned about a uh, park or something. And um, I've talked about that land too. Is there any other sort of recreational space that I'm not aware of in, in the village? Like I heard somebody once talking about some trails, but I assume those are on private land. Is that, do you know, Liz? I think Lindsay talked about walking on some trails. Yeah, they, um, so behind our house, which is on the east side of Route 100, um, there's a large property that's most, mostly owned by the Cubitt family. Um, mm -hmm. And they have trails throughout there because it used to be an active um, maple orchard. So they have graciously allowed anyone who lives adjacent to hike on their land, which has been really great. So it's not public space, but it's space that's used a lot by people that right. live in the neighborhood. Um, and I know back in the day that used to be where there was a, a tow rope for skiing during the winter time. So yeah, it, it, has, it has a history of being used by people in the neighborhood. Right. But is there any other thing that's public that's recreational? Well, there's the river, obviously. Um, yeah, I don't and, the, and the access to the river is, is sort of an informally <laughs> publicly used space, but it's property that's owned by, um, I think, Jeff Minash or someone in the Minash fam yep. family owns that. But, uh, you know, they, they give permission to people to access the river there. In, in terms of that recreational question, you know, I've heard folks talk about a park, about river access. Um, what types of things would people like to see available in the village, either things that aren't there or things that could be enhanced. I would love for there to somehow be a connection to the rail trail. If I could ride my bike out my driveway <laughs> to someplace safe and then make my way to the rail trail, that would be awesome. <laughs> and I know we and I know we have like the Cricket Hill trails. Like there are other trail networks that are not super far away. I don't know how crazy of an undertaking it would be to connect all those things. It would be huge. <laughs> I worked on the rail trail for twelve years. It's 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 it would be a huge undertaking. There's been talk about how you would get pedestrians across the roundabout in Hyde Park Village for whatever reason. And then I asked the question, what would be the reason uh, that you would want to cross the, the roundabout? Where are you going? There's no place to go, except for unless you lived right there. Uh, so uh, 
the only way that would ever happen would be similar to what Stowe has been trying to do, and I don't know where that's at. I think they've pretty much given up, but they've been trying to get a trail to come from Stowe to meet up uh, uh, in, uh, uh, with a rail trail in, in Morrisville, and they have, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's been absolutely a nightmare trying to get the right combination of landowners to to let them use the to build the trail. And it would be the same problem going uh, from either, you got to go either to Hyde Park or Johnson. And Johnson would probably be the better because you don't have to cross the down the belt. You'd be taking your life in your own hands to do that. Um, but uh, it's hard for even Johnson, it's, it's been even hard to get from the rail trail to their village. And it's only a quarter of a mile. Uh, they really need to build a bridge out behind the library somewhere to get across the river so that people don't have to drive on the street or on the sidewalk or walk on the sidewalk or whatever. So it's not, yeah, it's uh, quite a pipe dream actually. I wish it could happen, but I don't see it. I'm dreaming big, Al. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think pedestrian access to the, to the one store that still exists in town, the people that you don't even really think of as being in town because it's on the other side of the river over that bridge with no sidewalk, you know, pedestrian access to the River Valley store would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I see one of our neighbors who walks there every day and just walks along the side of the road. Yeah. I don't what know her need? name, but I'm sure she'd appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, what you need there is to, is to be able to leave the road um, near the intersection somewhere and go down and cross the river and, and end up the other side. But there again, it's hard to get access, uh, hard to get permission from landowners. But. Or you could start thoughts? a store, Liz. You could start a store. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess a, a question for folks who live in the village, um, where do you go to get, you know, convenience items, groceries, uh, pharmacy type stuff currently? Yeah, Morrisville. Street, Morrisville. Is that pretty much where people go? So, yeah. I, I do, but I also go to Johnson. I go to Sterling Market a lot in Johnson. Yeah, yeah that's Quite. a good place. And we go to the River Valley store when we just need milk or need a beer, <laughs> need a snack. But uh, it seems ridiculous sometimes to get in the car to do that when we live so close. Yeah. yeah. Unnecessary. If you're getting in the car, you might as well go all the way to the grocery store and get all the other things you need. <laughs> <laughs> I actually leave Hyde Park and go to an Eden General Store to get my meat, because their meat is a lot better than anything you can get in Morrisville. Um, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to look into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think someone just tried to say something, but it didn't quite come through. Um, whoever that was, try to repeat. No, it was just me, Amy. I just said that Eden General is a game changer for me driving from Hyde Park to Lowell. I don't have to go into Morrisville to pick things up. I can just head straight home. I'm curious, and I don't expect anyone on this call to have the answer, but I would like to explore what we can do to attract some small businesses back to North Hyde Park Village. You know, knowing that there was once, you know, two or three general stores, you know, th that infrastructure has all been taken over and become private residences for the most part, but there are still some commercial spaces and there's the, um, like kind of the office park area that's just north of the village. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I wonder what, what would help attract businesses to our neighborhood. I know part of it is an infrastructure thing, like there's not the sewage capacity currently. 
don't know. Yeah, that's, an, else. that's another issue that our committee has probably will have to address because you cannot get anything up for a business into North Hyde Park right now because of septic, lack of septic. What we do have though is um, broadband internet, which not all neighborhoods have. So if someone had a business that was more digitally based, this could be an attractive place for them. In, in terms of, um, you know, the businesses, small businesses, what are some things that aren't there or aren't easily accessible that people would, you know, like to see? A, a, a coffee shop, like a, a place where you could get, I mean, like a, a diner, essentially, some place that could be open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, where you could also get a good cup of coffee. I'll second that. Yeah. Well, that that used and I work from home, so just an excuse to get out of the house <laughs> someplace where we can just walk nearby. Well, that coffee, used to be the, gen the River Valley store used to be that. However, I don't think they're doing uh, food anymore, are they? Hot food? You might get a coffee there, but I don't think they're doing hot food anymore. I don't know. But they have the equipment in the room. Um, so. Yeah, they have that space out back, but I, I don't think I've, I've ever seen that in use in the three years that we've been here. I think that's kind uh, of scaled it, back now. Yeah, it used to be very busy. They had a person who sub sublet that little space in the back, and they made a lot of good food, yeah, semi-good food. Well, Liz, yeah. didn't you say that they're trying to sell that store anyway? I That's think they I are, think. but... Yeah. Well, Zeph, you ready to reboot your uh, career as a <laughs> selling food to people? As a what? What, was, what did you used to do, Zeph? <laughs> Liz and I ran a food truck. Great. Perfect. And, and, it, and Liz kind of kept it going for a while as a catering business. Not kind of. Liz kept it going for a while as a catering business. I have got there enough. There you go. <laughs> don't need another project. <laughs> well, that's probably true. You don't. No, but, but a food truck where, you know, might not run by Liz and Seth necessarily, but that is, that's, something to consider for North Hyde. It wouldn't help in the winter, so nine months out of the year probably wouldn't be as much fun, but um, but that's something to think about. And then when you were also just saying, Al, about they would lease the space at the um, store, what if, I don't know if that could be incorporated into the Grange. I know there's a kitchen, but I don't think it's a capacity for something like that, but wouldn't that be kind of cool to have like a taco night or, you know, the, the vendors who come to Tuesday night live, like have one person every you know week come and do maybe the Nepalese food by Raymond Dewan one night and, you know, something like that. I don't know. It's just, that's going back to the Grange and not looking out beyond the Grange, but just mm -hmm. another thought. Yeah. Something to keep in mind with the food truck. Um, yeah. Uh, issue is that for communities and villages like North Hyde Park that have the septic limitation that Al mentioned, um, food trucks can be a really good tool uh, for overcoming that um, because you're not necessarily needing an on-site wastewater. Um, you know, the owner has to manage that, uh, you know, obviously. But the thing that really drives wastewater for uh, food-based businesses is um, the seating and the, the management, um, at least under the state rules. So that can be a good tool um, you know, to meet that sort of demand um, on an interim basis while you're figuring out things like wastewater. I think a future purpose for the Heath Lumber property could be food truck park. Just yeah. throwing that out there. Yeah. Or also, certainly, the, the, if there was, again, if there was a sidewalk, the parking lot next to the post office would be ideal for that as well. And the lawn in front of the Grange Hall is pretty much a perfect spot to park a food truck for events as well. 
you've got that little building that uh, used to be the old fire station that's owned by the board. Uh, that's got a little parking lot. They could put a truck there too. You could be the, the food truck capital of Lamoille County. <laughs> You've got enough spots. <laughs> Well, you know, there between the, the industrial park and north of the village and what few other business there is, there is around and you got your local residents, uh, I think a food truck might do fairly well there. Yeah. Uh, you know, people will step out of their house and go buy a hamburger before they'll make one of their own. <laughs> So are you saying that, uh, Zeph, that like even this 4th of July thing that we're kind of hoping to do at the hall, you don't think even that's a good idea because we can't safely get people to the hall? No, 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 no. I didn't mean to imply that I think it's, it's that everything's on hold, but sort of the, the bigger things that where you're trying to attract a crowd where you might be expecting like where you're, where you're maybe thinking about the capacity of the hall. Um, I, I think things like that are for the future. But no, I mean, we should be, I think we and you should be trying to do whatever is safely feasible in the meantime. Okay. So um, we are approaching the end of the time we put for this visioning uh, discussion, but I want to make sure we hear from everybody. So. Um, if anyone has any thoughts of uh, things that we haven't talked about, um, please uh, share them. I suppose the one other thing that I'm wondering about is if there's a way to, I mean, there's a big project with the hall, you know, taking care of it, renovating it, thinking about it. And maybe it's all stuff that has to be done by, independent, you know, you have to hire people to do a lot of the stuff, but is there any way of sensibly organizing that maybe through the tech center or getting, using the project of the mm -hmm. hall as a skills based learning community project? It's really hard to get volunteers to coordinate to do stuff, I know, but if you had discrete projects that I don't know, whatever. I don't know what they would be because it's all big and hard right now in my mind. But, um, you know, something like Al's got a project going in the basement that for my, you know, is complicated. You got to, to fill in the basement windows. Would there be some people who'd be interested in helping on that and learning a skill or I guess it's, I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's the question in the long mm -hmm. run we engage people in the work that needs to be done at the building. Yeah, I would, I would sort of add that the, you know, the tech center um, in Hyde Park is a regional asset. Um, they do have a building trades program. Um, it's definitely might be worth talking with them about discrete uh, projects. Um, an observation as sort of a, again, an outside perspective um, is that in planning, one of the things we look for are what we call industry clusters. Um, and in the North Hyde Park Industrial Park, you actually have one. Um, I'm not sure if you did this intentionally, but it's actually, you know, as a planner, pretty cool that you have it with the um, wood products industry. You have the Guyon Valley uh, Millworks, you have the, um, the uh, um, uh, pellet, wood pellet supplier, the firewood supplier, you have the um, teak oil manufacturer, um, and they're all, you know, um, I think a, an, an asset both for the employees who become a potential base of customers for these things we're talking about, and then a, a skill set that, that, you know, you have uh, in, in the community as well to, to think about. Um, are there any other sort of 
ideas related to this future vision for uh, the, the village before we move on? All right, thank you. This was a great illuminating discussion. Um, a lot of it did really focus on transportation uh, issues and transportation safety issues. So I've asked uh, my colleague, Rob Moore, who's LCPC's transportation planner, just to join you and give you kind of an overview of options uh, that are available to you and sort of a discussion of the process um, from you know getting to where you are to where you want to be. So, Rob. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, great meeting. Um, lots of really good ideas. Um, brainstorming is uh, is really fun um, because all ideas are good ideas. It's the next step after that where we start to sort out what's actually possible and 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 when. Um, so this is this is on a great path, a great start to this project. Um, yeah, the, the discussions uh, seem to uh, related to transportation seem to really be around um, uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, safety as well as um, uh, speeding vehicles and geometry of the road and whatnot. Um, the uh, um, uh, this, the, the current conditions is, is that it is a state-owned highway. And um, so therefore, um, as we move forward with, um, you know, ideas, we'll want to be discussing, um, you know, some of the details of the brainstorming with uh, specific VTrans staff to get their reactions and their feedback, which will then help inform our next steps and actually help us shape our ideas and refine our ideas uh, into into achievable milestones, um, and uh, so I, I guess uh, you know that's a good uh, point for me to to acknowledge that um, you know as they say Rome wasn't built in a day, and um, taking little baby steps uh, is um, sometimes frustrating, but definitely demonstrates uh, a deliberate and conscious effort towards uh, towards a vision that has been established. Um, and so that sort of approach is uh, usually um, um, welcomed by the state agency. Um, so um, we can definitely, uh, uh, and we do already have plans um, as part of this project to, to bring some uh, Vitrian safety experts and bicycle and pedestrian experts uh, up to North Hyde Park and take a look around. Um, and that will help us uh, start to refine our ideas, as I mentioned. Uh, that's going to happen um, later this summer, um, and it will have to be a small group of people given um, COVID safety precautions and all of that. Um, but uh, uh, we, can, we can talk with them um, in that informal setting about really whatever we want to. And so uh, pedestrian crossing, uh, concerns um, seems to be very high on the list um, and speed limit um, uh, signage and um, um, uh, you know gateway sort of um, aesthetic treatments are also something we can discuss uh, like a welcome to North Hyde Park Village is something that we could discuss with those folks uh, as well as um, traffic control signs, which would be like a slow pedestrian zone or pedestrian crossing here, or uh, ultimately when the demands um, exist, because this will be a success, uh, it could warrant, you know, flashing lights that, that get activated when someone needs to cross the road. Um, so uh, the, the pedestrian safety and, and speeding are something that we could, we could definitely tackle first. Um, um, there will be some, you know, back and forth uh, with VTrans about um, uh, how uh, the best path forward to get there, and that's where then differing opinions start to come in. Um, but we'll we'll hear them out. Um, you know, they they might suggest that the town um, could uh, take ownership of that section of of state highway, which of course is a, is a can of worms in itself, so to speak, as a as a conversation. 
um, but nonetheless uh, is sort of back in that brainstorming category. Um, it, would, would, the, would the net gains um, outweigh uh, the, net, the net costs um, for the locals? And that's a decision that the local uh, you know, residents as yourselves um, uh, are better equipped to, to make those sorts of decisions once you have the information um, at hand. Um, so, um, uh, further um, ideas that might be a little more advanced or require some f deeper, um, more um, elaborate sort of engineering um, would be, you know, some of the islands um, um, or, or other traffic calming measures that were discussed. Uh, again, it's not off the table at this point, but. Um, we will navigate that path and, and help this committee identify uh, the smoothest path forward to achieving milestones along the way. Um, and so we might, we might recognize that we have an idea that we wanna go for, but part of that path and taking baby steps moving forward would be to, um, to recognize the, the, harder, the harder hurdles to jump over and the, the hurdles that take longer to get to jump over. Um, so that's part of what we'll be doing, uh, working with you and supporting this committee is helping to identify um, longer term goals and action items that are feasible versus shorter term um, action items that are feasible. Um, so um, is there any, um, does anyone else have, have specific questions or um, specific comments about um, what I've been saying or transportation um, safety concerns in general? I have a question, Rob. Um, you know this, are you familiar with North Hyde Park, that stretch between uh, the parking lot at the, on the other side of the post office down to the hall? It's yes. From what, two buildings, I think, or three, two buildings. I mean, is is there such a thing when you're dealing with VTrans of having a, a thing that says, you know, this sidewalk is, is a big deal, that, that you could carve out and do that sidewalk without waiting until you get through all the hurdles of the big, big, big hard stuff? Or is that not how they operate? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, as someone else mentioned earlier that there was a study done around 2016 or so um, and that, that has actually laid the groundwork for this conversation um, to continue with VTrans. Uh, VTrans did identify some concerns, one of them being a, a, a sidewalk. Um, but uh, that said, um, uh, when VTrans voices a concern, um, that's not a hard, that's not necessarily a hard no. Um, but rather an opportunity for us to engage them further in conversation and learn um, why they're hesitant about it. And um, when you identify those factors that bring pause uh, to VTrans, then we can um, see what we can do about those specific issues. Uh, it could be as simple as the way we're describing it, or it could be more complicated as far as um, uh, some further engineering or further study is required. Um, and um, things like sidewalks, the last point, um, do take a lot of money um, to build. Um, unfortunately, they're not, they're not cheap. Um, uh, but there's options within that as well. Um, so yes, sorry, that's a long answer that uh, sidewalks along Route 100 um, and or Ferry Street have been looked at in the past. The concept has been explored. Um, it is feasible from a concept level engineering, um, but there are a few hurdles that we would need to jump over and, and um, navigate in those conversations with VTrans. Um, the effect of that will be the timing, the timing, the timeline of how long it will take and the cost uh, resources that will be needed um, to, to make that happen. I think I think the um, I I just like to maybe I think the specific question was more is it feasible to think about doing a small section of sidewalk 
at some point as a short-term goal or is sidewalks generally something that's long-term and one one big project okay thank yeah thanks for clarifying yeah uh, perhaps perhaps that would be applicable in this situation um, there's also other short-term steps that could be considered as we work towards convincing vtrans that it's a good idea uh, if, for example the use of the existing shoulders and the geometry of those existing shoulders um, all of us that live in Lamoille County fully know that um, uh, road, the roadside itself, the, the shoulder of the road is a bicycle and pedestrian facility. No, it's not a concrete sidewalk or a nice smooth rail trail, but that is the facility. That's what we have and that's what we use. Um, and so that's kind of the direction that, that we could go in there. Uh, as far as uh, documenting the demand um, that currently exists and trying to project what demand might be coming in the future with these new uses like the Grange Hall um, and uh, work with the town to determine um, if it's feasible to try to chip off uh, short sections of sidewalk with local funding or maybe small grant programs uh, versus, uh, you know, jumping in and uh, requesting a larger grant um, uh, source of funding to build a longer stretch of sidewalk. Um, we would need to um, consider that further and sort of uh, strategically um, decide uh, which, which are the best steps at which time um, to move forward. So it, it, it's possible that uh, the very short term might be uh, uh, let's demonstrate that there is demand and, and, and widespread use of the shoulders. Um, that could lead to some sort of approval for short sections of, of sidewalk and perhaps a, a pedestrian area or a pedestrian zone um, sort of signs, um, which then uh, it, it, it becomes a, a, a a positive feedback loop where once you start to have these facilities and are building comfort um, with the people that are, are walking them, such as yourselves, the, in theory, more and more people then start to use that facility, demand increases even further, and then there's some demonstration there that, that the hard infrastructure, um, the physical infrastructure, uh, which is often expensive, is worthwhile. Um, so, uh, baby steps again, I think is maybe the best way to go uh, as far as our, our thinking, um, data collection to see what we have going on now, and then evaluating what would our be our be what would be our best strategy uh, for the next step in um, advancing the conversation with VTrans and identifying funding for uh, the the example of a sidewalk. And Rob, I'm going to jump in for a quick second um, because I'm going to share a uh, link to um, a Google uh, documents form that is actually you know a way to, for you who are participating um, to share additional feedback um, at the bottom you're gonna see some check boxes of things that you're interested in um, Rob has alluded to this uh, data collection piece um, one of the major uh, th pieces of sort of proving to VTrans um, that you know a, a, a sidewalk or a crosswalk is needed and getting the permissions is um, demonstrating that there's pedestrian activity um, and that is something that you as residents may be better able to do uh, than um, we can because you're actually there when people are walking um, you know if, if we ask VTrans to do a study they will send their staff probably up at you know three o'clock in the afternoon, maybe when people aren't around, just because that's what their work schedules are. Um, so one of those boxes includes, you know, uh, volunteering to um, assist with uh, gathering some of that data. Um, and Rob, I'm wondering if in the time we have left, which is about five minutes uh, to seven, mm -hmm. um, you might be able to just briefly explain that piece of this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, um, as you're pulling that up, I will, I will say that um, the expertise, the expertise that, that Seth and, and Kate bring to this team is um, 
uh, identifying um, uh, the, the, the places within the rules that, that, that have, uh, have room for, for threading the needle. Um, so, um, uh, for example, uh, North Hyde Park as a designated village um, has a special uh, path through the rules about um, crosswalks. And so um, uh, we, because of that village designation, we have the ability to talk about this and frame the conversation with VTrans in that context so they don't see it as someone is asking for a, a, a crossing of Route 100 in the middle of nowhere. They're asking for a crossing in a designated village, um, which they have flexibility according to their own rules even if it, even if all the data doesn't line up perfectly, um, they have the ability to to view it in this other way. Um, so that's a great example of of how we might navigate it. Um, Seth, I'm not seeing that spreadsheet. If you're sharing it, um, is um, I sent this through the Zoom chat. Is has anyone seen it? Okay, I see the chat now. Yep. Okay. Yep, so you have to, uh, for folks, you have to hover your cursor around until the bar, uh, the menu bar at the bottom pops up and then you hit chat and that opens up and link, uh, uh, Seth posted a link there. Yeah. So if I click on that link, it's gonna, um, yep, this is great. It, this is a nice um, survey. Um, for uh, to, to help us understand better and, and give you an opportunity to articulate your thoughts um, about, about this project. And so um, one of the things that's on the checklist uh, that Seth mentioned, um, uh, among other things, Gion, uh, the, the hall and um, local businesses and, and pedestrian safety is, is uh, traffic calming uh, as well. So um, the pedestrian and bicycle safety, I guess would be the box. Uh, if you're interested in helping with um, uh, collecting data that would support um, the, us demonstrating that there is a demand for, for pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, um, that would be the box to check and we would be very happy to provide a training um, to this group uh, where you could then even recruit other people and you could train them yourselves. Uh, we have a simple one page form that you would take out uh, on, on a clipboard and um, take notes on what uh, pedestrian activity there is so we could train you on doing that. A companion form that we have that goes along with that which I, I have a feeling this group will find very useful um, based on the stories I was hearing earlier, uh, is a, a um, observational data is, is what I've been calling it. Um, and so the two items um, together, uh, where one item is the actual counting of this many pedestrians passed by this location at this time, um, the, this observational data is uh, the, the, a way for, for us to document, um, uh, well, I'm thinking of some Al's examples of, uh, you know, cars pulling out from um, 100C, um, not realizing that the other traffic doesn't stop. Um, there was discussions about uh, uh, walking to the river uh, store. Um, and, uh, and the challenges there, uh, people on their cell phones, not paying attention, um, near misses, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, you know I, I can very, um, very easily imagine the situation where you're, you're counting pedestrians and bicycles and, and you can't help but notice that three different cars almost hit three different people because they were on their cell phone, for example. That would be, observations that once they're written down by uh, committee members such as yourselves that that itself becomes data and that becomes part of our story and part of uh, part of the narrative that we present to VTrans. Um, so again we'd be happy to train you on collecting that data and collecting those observations in a way that would be usable um, 
for for us to move forward. Uh, yeah, and I, I have the, um, I received the training from you, Rob, sometime, I think that was last year. So I have those forms handy if anyone in the neighborhood ever wants to just hit me up for a, a quick training or to get copies of those forms from me, I'm happy to help. Excellent, thank you. Um, Rob, I have a question, it's Mary. Um, the, uh, uh, presumably, an observation is that, you know, in, in the space of five minutes, five massive trucks went whizzing through town. So no wonder nobody's walking on the side of the street. Yes, absolutely. That, that, would, that would be fine. Apparent um, speeding. You know, it appears that that vehicle is speeding. You're not out there with a radar gun. But, uh, you know, well, we all know when someone is speeding. <laughs> But it's also the size of the vehicles and the frequency of truck traffic. I mean, you don't have to sit there very long to see that it's, um, you know, in other words, it's behind the question is the fact that there isn't a lot of pedestrian, there's less pedestrian traffic than there would be because of the, um, the traffic situation. I mean, Absolutely, I follow that. And that even builds the case for why having a separate sidewalk is, is even that much more important. And the other question I have is when you say sidewalks are very expensive, do I have in my mind that in that 2016 or 24, whatever that study, that they had something other than, there was some, something that's a modified sidewalk. It was either grass or it, is there something or am I confusing um, runoff and issues related? Anyway, the question is, is there something that's not a full sidewalk that is equally functional as a sidewalk, but lighter touch and less expensive. Absolutely, yes. There, there are various degrees of possibilities there from um, uh, uh, just the road shoulder itself, as I mentioned, through these sort of um, gravel or grass paths, um, all the way up to a, a concrete or asphalt sidewalk. Okay. Yep, and I believe that, that uh, I, it's, I have to admit, it's been a little while since I've looked at that report, but I believe that may have been the town's preferred alternative, was this uh, grass or gravel pathway um, on the side of Route 100 that would connect uh, via a crosswalk with an island <clears throat> to Ferry Street. I believe that was the preferred, Seth, does that ring a bell? I'd have to... Um look at the report again, but I, I think there was a section that was a sort of gravel grass mix as opposed to a concrete sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's definitely a, a place for interim measures of reclaiming space for um, pedestrians. The, the thing you don't get is also the thing that makes sidewalks expensive, which is establishing some kind of vertical separation. Um, mm -hmm. You know that's the the curb, um, and with heavy truck traffic, that can be um, a real comfort. Um, but as an interim measure, you know, if it's current conditions or a, you know gravel expanded shoulder, um, sometimes those interim measures can be very valuable. Yeah, absolutely, uh, really good point. And um, mm -hmm. there may be, there may even be some historical references. Uh, I know a lot of you folks mm -hmm. are interested in the history of, of North Hyde Park, and uh, I'm familiar with some photographs of, uh, I believe it's yep. Cambridge Village, that show uh, paths that people walk on um, next to the road. It happened to be grass. It's in between the road and somebody's fence. And um, that, that is the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s version of a sidewalk. That is it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that, that's sort of what, what you're asking about is, could we build something like that? Absolutely. Um, that, that, could, that could be something that we decide to move forward with VTrans and, uh, and that strategy as we develop it, that may, that may be what we come back to as a smoother path forward for everybody um, in, in, as an interim step. Yeah. Uh, there, can I just say something? There are also, I think, many opportunities that I, I'm looking forward to exploring about how to um, do what uh, sort of, you know, in the biz we call um, narrow 
entering the, vi the visual field. Um, and that automatically uh, uh, helps to curb speed. So one of the classic ways that, that um, uh, municipalities have done this historically is by uh, things like street trees and on-street parking. Uh, um, so, you know, some of that is, is not um, realistic um, in, in the village, but, you know, it, I, I wouldn't rule out um, entirely um, some options. Um, and that can really kind of um, create the, the uh, physical design condition that sort of enforces the slower speeds that I think you guys are looking for, um, rather than you know, um, I'm usually not a big fan of cluttering things up with a whole bunch of signage. Um, and then you have these very uh, overly wide, overly paved conditions that just in, particularly in a straightaway uh, condition like the Village Main Street that just, you know, don't do anything to actually um, enforce the, the speed limit. Um, so I think, anyway, I think there's some, some options that um, we can maybe do some exploring on, um, some of which uh, will require, you know, the blessing and permission of VTrans, which as Rob has said, is, is not something that is easy to get necessarily, but there's some other things that can be done that um, don't require that. And, um, and, and um, it, I, I think it's a way to sort of set the table for some of the change that you guys are hoping to um, to ultimately find. Yep, I want to just jump in uh, quickly and acknowledge that you know it is past seven. Um, folks who you know have other commitments can feel free to um, step out. We would ask that if you are able to complete that uh, Google uh, survey, which you can access on the link in the uh, chat, uh, that you do just so that we can uh, get a hold of you. Um, Anyone who wants to stay and continue to talk about these things is, is more than welcome to. Um, but, you know, I recognize we said we'd be done by seven. So if folks have other commitments, uh, feel free to, to uh, step off. Um, so I guess with that said, um, are there other thoughts or questions on these transportation issues, um, you know, it's not insurmountable to work through VTrans, but there's definitely a process that we need to follow. Um, and that's part of, uh, you know, helping you prepare for that process is one of the major goals of this uh, project. I have a question. Because the road is a state highway, does VTrans kind of have the final say on any street Escaping traffic calming measures, even if they're happening not on like the pavement of the actual road, but if they're happening in the shoulder or just adjacent to the road. Yes, is the short answer to that. Uh, they own um, the right of way, which is typically uh, 50 feet centered on the yellow line. Um, but we would need to do a little bit of research. Sometimes it's bigger than that. Sometimes it's a little smaller. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's typically 50 feet centered on the road. So 25 feet on either side, they have control over. So, uh, your question has made me think about, uh, a welcome to North Hyde Park sign. Um, you see those in other towns that may be sponsored by the, the Rotary Club or the Lions Club or somebody like that. Um, and, uh, often those signs are placed outside of the right-of-way mm. so that VTrans has no authority to give or deny permission. Um, and that right-of-way question that you asked is also related to um, that uh, I, I kind of alluded to when, when, when we do engage VTrans with these conversations. And again, a hesitation from VTrans is not a no. It's an opportunity to discuss it. And when we discuss it, it's possible that they say, well, if Hyde Park Town wants to take ownership of this road, you have a lot more leeway on what you can, what you can do because we're no longer plowing it. The town of Hyde Park would be plowing it. Um, so 
we're prepared for them to bring that up, uh, but we will need input from this committee and the town specifically on um, what our response to that suggestion should be. I have a feeling that it will be no thanks. Um, we don't want to own Route 100 through the village, but um, it that gets to your question exactly. But is, uh, can, can I can I just say something? Sorry about the about the um, the Class One highway status. So um, it, it's I, I think it can be something that you can aspire to um, eventually. And and here's why um, the. Uh, I think the key to looking at it is what is the value of the placemaking that you can achieve when you control the right of way and how does that support your community development goals, specifically economic development, you know, the, the attracting businesses and things like that, the, the sense of place, the sense of identity, attracting new residents, all of those kinds of things which are, um, you know, I, I it's my understanding that the select board is 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 very interested in you know increasing the grand list you know so so uh class one highway uh status is a tool that can help facilitate that so it might not be something that um um they're they're necessarily prepared to agree to do right off the bat but it can be framed um, as something that is would be very value added and something that you can aspire to um, over time over time so it's that it's that kind of incremental iterative process that Rob has been talking about um, yeah that's a great point Kate that helps us uh, it, it, it helps us strategize as far as deciding is that sort of thing um, achievable in the short term versus the long term and I, I loved how you used the word value. Uh, all of the things you mentioned <clears throat> have a value to them. And that's the decision making part that would come into play with the class one is what are the pros and cons? What are the budgetary pluses and minuses? And what sort of other things are hard to put a finger on an exact cost? It's a little more intangible, but everyone agrees they clearly have a value. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to sort of emphasize that sort of iterative long term um, because there are steps in between sort of the absolute rule of, you know, through traffic um, uh, condition and the class one, um, especially in the village center. Uh, designation one of the opportunities that that uh, gives you is that there is a process by which the V trans can or will allow things like street trees um, provided there are man within the right of way provided there are management agreements so that V trans isn't responsible for you know pruning and maintaining um, so that's sort of easing into that idea of the community having more ownership of the state uh, right of way. Um, similarly, if you were to do a sidewalk, um, it's almost guaranteed that VTrans would say, um, um, you know, the, t the community has to be responsible for plowing. They're not going to plow a, a local uh, sidewalk, but again, those are all interim steps of um, establishing that greater community role in, in the right of way, um, short of class uh, uh, class one uh, status. Um, and while we're talking about class one status too, I, I should say that the the statement, you know, or the concern that it means absolute responsibility for the state right-of-way is not entirely the case. Um, the town towns with class one highways do still receive uh, annual aid money, uh, mileage money, um, as well as VTrans maintains striping and a, a, pave, a repaving schedule. Um, so it's really the plowing and the annual maintenance, not the cute, you know, very large capital expense. Um, Though um, 
there are certainly places where it is an appropriate tool and places that it's that it's not. Um, and there are areas of gray between what you have now and, and that, you know, potential future condition. <laughs> Sometimes you get the impression, and I'll, I'll just warn you all of this when you meet with VTrans, that class one is your only option for um, crosswalks and sidewalks and street trees. And because you're a village center designation, uh, you have a lot of gray in between. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure they will start the conversation from there, um, just to be aware of that. Um, there are other thoughts or questions while we're all still here. I have a question about this traffic data stuff. Now, is there, who's running that? Is there a date to start doing it? Or because Liz can train us, we just start collecting? Or, uh, I mean, is there a beginning, I guess, to that? If, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's any time. You can start any time. Uh, Liz is, is trained and has the ability to share that. Um, knowledge with you folks. Um, encourage everyone to be safe. Um, wear bright colors if possible. Uh, stay out of the the travel lane, especially. Uh, a lawn chair up uh, off the road is is usually a nice way to do it. Or sitting in your car. Um, so yeah, as volunteers, you can engage in that at any time if you feel comfortable. Uh, with what Liz can share with you. If you feel like you want additional training from LCPC, just let us know and we'll set that up as soon as we can. Um, and then LCPC will also be doing some of our own counts and I'm not sure exactly um, off, off the cuff here, I'm not exactly sure what that's gonna look like, but we'll do some traffic counting to collect data on the vehicles as well as um, uh, the, the bike, bike and ped. But, for a nice uh, uh, volume of data, we really will need to rely on community engagement and community participation for that. We'll, we'll establish some baseline data and we will definitely do the traffic counting piece. Um, but to get a nice, a nice pile of data about bike and ped, we will, we will need your help. Well, then maybe you guys could follow up and tell us when's a good time of day or how often during the week or so that we're not counting stuff that's not useful data so sure um yeah so uh as as locals you would know the the most likely time that there's the highest volume of people so you probably do want to target that um you may also want to target a time of day that you know is a lower volume and have that as a comparison um, really relying on your own knowledge of the local use of those shoulders, maybe Saturday morning at 9 a.m. is the busiest time and that's when you should get some counts or maybe it's, um, you know, Thursday night for some reason and that's when you would want to do it. Um, when LCPC does counts, for the most part, we do them during our working hours. Now we stretch that out. There were times when we did some counts for Hyde Park related to the high school and the elementary school. We started, I think we started at 6 a.m. Um, to make sure that we caught all of the students that were walking and biking to school. Some of them go in early for different reasons. And then we, again in the afternoon, we aimed for, I believe uh, it was two, two to five or, or three to six p.m., something like that. Again, just to try to capture the students actually leaving the school building. Um, but because that's not the context up in North Hyde Park, I would actually be looking to you to tell me when you expect the highest demand to be. Um, and hopefully that's uh, at, a, at a reasonable time of day. LCPC staff is flexible. We are able to, um, you know, work earlier than 8 a.m. and after 5 p.m., obviously, uh, and we're also able to do an occasional weekend. Um, but um, because we don't have the capacity to do that kind of schedule constantly throughout the duration of this project, that's where we, we're relying on your help. I saw CD with a raised hand, so 
if you have a question, go ahead. So one of the reasons we are sharing that uh, Google survey is, um, you know, because if people are interested in specific projects or specific areas, we can follow up uh, with you. Um, if this were, a, you know, a, um, old fashioned meeting when we were all in person, I'd be passing out a clipboard for you to sign and give your contact information. We can't do that. Um, but, you know, these projects are most successful when something happens after the meeting. Um, so please do fill that out. Um, and if you want to participate in specific areas, please check uh, the box so we can follow up. Um, some of these details about when to count, those are exactly the type of reasons we'd, we'd like to be able to follow up with you to organize uh, things like that. Um, while we're all still together, are there any other um, thoughts or issues? Um, they don't necessarily have to be traffic related uh, at this point that uh, folks want to share before we um, um, call it a night. Uh, one question from Ron for Rob Moore. Uh, it sounds like Liz is the collector of data for this traffic stuff. And if we're going to ball it all together at some point, uh, do we sort of need a manager of data, like consciously knowing that data collection stopped, you know, for six months and we really should be reminding the neighborhood to get out there and report. I mean, it, I know you're, the answer is always, you gotta, you know, make a case for your request. And it's this morning I was dealing with a case where internal VTrans departments were trying to make a case against each other about moving forward with a project. So it's not just us kind of thing, but when we do go forward and say, hey, we've got a crosswalk meet at the post office. We wanna present them with whatever we have, but if people lost track of it and six months goes by, um, then we're kind of scrambling, I guess. So anyway, I just wanted to put that on the table as it is a little bit more than just asking the question. It's consciously during this project with MPG 20, after MPG 20, going on to the, you know, this is a multi-year, you know, decades long type of window that we're looking down, not something's going to happen next summer. So, so and I don't know what that is. I, it, it's a checklist. Liz is the checklist keeper. She sees nothing was checked off or submitted for three months. She puts out a call. She gets a bunch of new reports, you know, photos are taken of events, which are helpful to VTrans. You know, somebody, you know, we can't have 10 people collecting that stuff for when it's needed. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm, I'm happy to be the, um, the person who reminds us that this is an ongoing effort. Um, I don't know, and I, and I can be the person who collects as well, but like right now I have the ones that I've done just been sitting on my desk for nine months. So I don't know if I should be giving those to you, Rob, or you, Seth, or like, what do you guys from LCPC recommend is the best data collection? Who's, who should hold the data? That's so, cool. yeah, please, Go ahead. please, yeah, please, um, you know, when you do do the counts, uh, send them uh, mm -hmm. to, to Rob and I. Um, we have transportation data for all of the communities on our server going back a while. Um, so as the data repository, it, it can live with us um, and should live with us. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that sounds great. Thank you, Seth. Um, so um, a scan via email works great. Um, if that's a problem, then um, uh, sending us the paper forms is also acceptable. Um, that said, I suppose we could arrange to pick them up um, or, or have you drop them off or something like that as well. Um, but yeah, if you have, do you think you have the ability to scan them to us? I know that I do. So if anyone doesn't and you want to just drop them in my mailbox, I can certainly scan them and get them to Rob and Seth. That's great, thank you, that would be ideal. So you can go ahead and send us whatever you have so far whenever you have a chance to do that. And then every so often send us a new batch. Yeah, I think that was my second point is, you know, whether it's part of MPG 20 or, or ongoing. Um, and Rob does this every year or somebody in LCP 
LCPC office will do it every year. Hey, we're getting ready to collect some data. What roads do you need done in your town? And it sort of needs to be the same for the North Hyde Park. It's like, hey, we've got data from last summer. Who's going to do it this summer? And let's make sure we can track these from year to year at least. But when I was watching the internal VTrans debate this morning, people are asking for documents. Take a picture of that piece of infrastructure as you drive by so that we can start to catalog that kind of data yeah. as well as numbers per se. Yeah, some of those issues like that, that um, Al mentioned of the, you know, complex, what sounds like some problematic turning movements, the lack of pedestrian facilities on the bridge. Um, those are the types of things that, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, and I, 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 I hate to say this, you're not going to get a new bridge uh, there soon. Um, but documenting issues like that and getting them, you know, in VTrain's radar for the time that there are repairs or there's a guardrail project or, you know, short of a new bridge are the types of things that really help you get what you need because um, once VTrain sort of starts on a project, um, it's almost too late to uh, get those things on the radar. Um, uh, you know, you've almost, you've really got to get in very, very early. Otherwise, because of their federal money, their federal constraints, it's very hard for them once they have final plans to say, oh, we're going to change this to a narrower guardrail to give you another foot of pedestrian space on the shoulder. Um, but if you get them just when they're beginning to have those conversations, especially if you have discussed it with the maintenance staff before and have pictures showing the problem, it's often very easy for them to say, oh, this is a small change at this point. Um, so yeah, I think this, this project, you know, this municipal planning grant in many ways is the, the, probably the start of a data collection effort and there are probably some smaller things we can do as a direct result for it. Um, but, you know, for some of these issues, you know, you're laying the groundwork for um, dealing with them in the future. Um, you know, um, Rob, do you have anything, you know, on, on that, you know, the traffic, the more typical traffic counting type of work that we do? Uh, yeah, no, that, that, that's all good. Yeah, photos are, are worth a thousand words for sure. Um, um, we, we, as part of our annual program and our work with, with the towns, we're able to do counts, um, repeating counts on an annual basis. Um, and so we can certainly uh, take a look at that with a direction from Ron about, about doing that and getting that into our work program um, on an annual basis uh, where we would have traffic volume types of vehicles and the speed of those vehicles um, is, is the outcome of that traffic data. Yep, so that gets to the question that, you know, you've been talking about is the truck traffic is, um, I, I, how do I say this? You know, everyone who lives on a state highway says there's too many trucks. Um, I think you and North Hyde Park might actually be right about that. <laughs> but the, the, the data, you know, that, a traffic count, a two count data, which is something we can do that really shows, you know, 10% are tractor trailers or 20% are tractor trailers is very valuable for VTrans. And, you know, the type of data that's more likely to get you some of the things you're asking for in terms of, you know, noise mitigation or pedestrian infrastructure or crossings, because you're demonstrating, you know, there's a, you know, there's a village here and there's a lot of trucks going through it. I'm I'm seeing the hand raised from CD again. Oh, can you guys hear me? Oh. Barely. Barely. Hi, this is Corey. I'm across from the Grand Hall. Kind of. And um, I was just going to say, I counted traffic a couple of weeks ago from 6.23 to 7.23 a.m. And there was 246 cars that went north and south. 38 of those were tractor trailers. Mm -hmm. Larger trucks, probably 60% of the people were speeding. 
um, this is all out of boredom and just tired of the traffic. But you know, with the whole day landfill being a cover tree, there's a lot of tractor trailers that speed through here. And so I, I would like to volunteer my services and also volunteer in my parking space over here if anyone needs it at the Grange Hall. Um, sorry for chiming in so late and some technical difficulties here in my work. Thank you, Corey. Um, if you want, Corey, I can drop in your mailbox the, the forms for doing the, the traffic count. If you want to just drop the data that you have there onto the form, I can pass it back to Rob. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, it is 7.30 and I'm, I need to hop off. And I'm sure other folks might need to as well. So Seth, was there anything else you wanted to make sure we talked about? We covered everything that, um, you know, we, we wanted to cover. Uh, the, I'd say three big things that I heard from all of you in terms of themes were that pedestrian safety speed issue, um, the community hubs issue specifically the Guyon Valley Hall and then I think Amy made the comment about a neighborhood being a place to go to not through um, and those are some good guiding uh, thoughts from this um, you know I, I recognize it is 730 so um, we'll probably uh, call it a night um, but please before you uh, sign off do um, check that form. Um, if you have trouble opening it, please feel free to email or message me. I'll put in my email in case folks want to uh, follow up with anything. Um, and um, thank you all for uh, giving us your uh, Wednesday evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, all. Have a good night. All right.